My name is Nancy Bui. Today is January the 12th, 2014. I am going to interview Mr. Uwe Simonetto at uh, uh, Southern California. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, can you state your name, your profession? Good afternoon, Nancy. I'm, my name is uh, Uwe Simonetto. My profession has been for the last 57 uh, years journalism. I've been a journalist, international reporter, writing in English, French, and German. Um, I also am, um, have a doctorate in, in theology. I'm a Lutheran, and occasionally I'm teaching theology. Um, but basically, I'm a writer. Wonderful. Uh, so um, we was uh, having honor to read your book called Duke, a reporter for a uh, for the wounded people in Vietnam, talking about your experience in Vietnam War. Can you tell us that well, when were you go, was there and what, uh, how, how you get there? Um, all right. I, I was sent. I, I was a staff correspondent for the Axel Springer newspaper empire. These were the largest, uh, this was the largest European publishing house in Hamburg at the time and Berlin. Um, and I came from New York. I had been a North American correspondent uh, operating out of New York City. And then, as of 1965, I kept going to Vietnam at the first time in, in, in January of 1965. And then I spent most of 1965 there, and then 66, 67, 68, including the Tet Offensive, much of 69. Then I left these employers and became a, a, a correspondent for Stern magazine, also of Hamburg, Germany. And I became North American correspondent again for that magazine, but again kept an eye on Vietnam and traveled over to, um, uh, to Saigon so in 1972. So I, over a span of actually seven years, eight years, I uh, focused on Vietnam, and for the first five years I spent most of my time in Vietnam, um, traveling either, either out of, um, at first out of New York and then finally out of Hong Kong where I lived. And usually I spent six weeks in, uh, in Saigon and in the countryside and with the troops, uh, and then three weeks in Hong Kong, and then six weeks, and this, this is how it worked. So um, we interviewed several American press um, about Vietnam War, yeah. and during the time you were there with them. So from Europe, how many reporters um, at the peak time present in Vietnam during the war? Well, the, at the time of Tet, I remember that, uh, um, Tet 68, um, we were about 600 uh, foreign correspondents. Now, some of those might have been Vietnamese in, uh, included, but they worked, if they were Vietnamese, they worked for the foreign media. Um, mainly American, some French, some German, some others, Australian. Um, and um, so that was that. When I first came to Vietnam, we were much less. Uh, there might have been, I don't know, a hundred or even less than that. But and, um, it, it built up to about 600, maybe more even. And then, of course, you had these visiting correspondents who popped in, and they were not the ones I didn't like very much because they popped in, they all had uh, fancy ideas, they uh, had no no knowledge of Vietnamese and, uh, and no knowledge or very little knowledge of French, which was then still the lingua franca of, uh, of the Vietnamese, if they corresponded, especially Vietnamese society, educated society, all spoke French. I did, conducted all my interviews in French. So, um, so you might at some point even have heard as many as seven or 800 uh, journalists traipsing about. You know. But alone, how many uh, they from Europe countries, European countries? Oh God, I, perhaps 50, 60, I don't know. And, and they were not always there. I mean, for a long time, I was the only German correspondent, West German correspondent, regular. Of course, they had, you had teams of um, German television teams and French television teams and others. Um, but regular correspondents who stayed on the story all the time, uh, I don't know, 50, 40, I don't know. We had a club um, of European correspondents because we took a different approach uh, to Vietnam than many of our colleagues. 
Um, we also took a greater interest in the Vietnamese people than the Americans did, which made, uh, in the case of the Americans, I can't even fault them. They had their forces there, we didn't. Um, we, had a, we, uh, we had a sort of regular dinner table on Thursdays at a restaurant, the best restaurant in Saigon called Atabeas, and they were about seven, eight, nine participating in there. But that was, of course, those who were in town. It's very hard to fathom it because most of us spend half the time or less than half the time in Saigon. And the rest of the time, we were with the forces. We were in the countryside. We traveled. I, I spent a lot of time in Hue and in, 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 in the areas north of Hue and down in the Delta and a lot of time in the Central Highlands. Uh, uh, with the Vietnamese, at times there were, there were no... Um, I didn't even go with Americans. I went with Vietnamese units or Korean units and others. You know. yeah, I'd like for you to um, tell us about... Um, you said that you, a European uh, reporter in Vietnam, you were more interested uh, to people, to the country, rather than American troops. So ca what did you see or well, how you feel about uh, the people, Vietnamese and the people you have contact with during the time you were there? Well, to us, the interest, we have a different form of journalism, and certainly in Germany we did, than they had here in this country. Um, we didn't have to run the regular daily story of how many people um, were killed and how many victories we won. Were won. Um, and we didn't have to write hometown articles about American soldiers, which, you know, it's I'm, not, uh, I'm not faulting them. If you represent the Minneapolis Tribune, you had to write about people from uh, Minnesota, um, so perfectly legitimate. But this was not our thing, you see. Um, we got much more immersed in the culture of Vietnam. We had read up on Vietnam. Some of the good American correspondents had too, but I mean, we had read up. I had read up on Vietnamese history, uh, on Vietnamese communism, on, uh, on, on Vietnamese um, on, on Buddhist theology, on, on, on uh, Confucianism. Um, so we, we took that approach because we felt that this, this war had to be covered from the perspective of, or, um, of the people who um, experienced this war. Uh, so not just, um, not just American soldiers. And that was the difference. Um, the, the music, the theater, the, uh, we had Vietnamese friends, quite a number, you know. And that, that helped a lot. And we attended dinner parties in Vietnamese homes, this sort of thing. By contact with them, talking to them, uh, how do you understand about Vietnamese mind at that time during the war? What are they fighting for? Well, um, what they, they, the people I, did, I, I dealt with, in, uh, Vietnamese people, um, they knew that they were fighting communism. They also knew that this was a proxy war. Now, some of them sympathized with the Viet Cong, which I found difficult to understand. Um, but basically, the Vietnamese, my Vietnamese contacts knew that this was a proxy war within the larger Cold War. Um, and so therefore, we, as, I as a German in particular, our country was divided. Um, uh, I was very aware and discussed this comparisons between my experiences as a West German and a refugee from East Germany, and there were lots of my Vietnamese friends who were refugees from North Vietnam. Um, we compared notes. Um, but the Vietnamese people that I knew, my friends, might have belonged to different Vietnamese uh, political branches, you know. Some were VNQDD, some were others, um, some were monarchists, um, etc. But I found none who uh, supported the communist line or the conquest of communism, the world conquest of communism. Um, sure, we, some of us were deceived. We know the Viet Cong had infiltrated the journalists. Uh, uh, the circle of journalists, we know fa there are famous stories about that, that Viet Cong had infiltrated, for example, um, a Reuters bureau, except that the Reuters bureau chief knew about it and could make good use of that. Um, but other journalists fell for the plot. 
Um, so we knew that. But uh, the Vietnamese people, and Nancy, if I may jump ahead of your question here, one thing is what I found extremely impressive about uh, the Vietnamese people were the free elections, which I covered, and which were not properly covered in this country. And they never said, do you know, have you any idea what it's like to co conduct free elections in the country fighting for its survival? The United Kingdom suspended elections during World War II. They had a coalition government between Labour and uh, between Conservatives and Labour. That is the ultimate democratic country. Here, the South Vietnamese braved going to brave terror. Viet Cong committed most heinous crimes to prohibit to prevent Vietnamese voters to go to the polls. This was extremely impressive and courageous. And that, I felt, was not sufficiently uh, described by most of the American media. There are great exceptions, and I, I do not want to generalize here. But I think there was a tendency to belittle it, as there is a tendency now to belittle uh, some of the Middle Eastern allies they have. So you seem to uh, cover most of the important uh, battle in Vietnam. Uh, do you remember any battle that uh, still uh, in your memory and you still have a lot of thinking on it? Well, yes. Uh, this picture showing me here on, on the cover of my, uh, of my book was taken at uh, Tet Mao Tan in, in Hue. Um, and you can see I have stubbles in my face and uh, dirty fingernails and guess what, because I spent weeks in combat. Uh, so obviously, uh, the two most memorable uh, battles that I had experienced, the three, uh, the most memorable was in Hue, 68, uh, and in, in Saigon, 68, too. And then I was in the Yadrang Valley battle in 1965. But where I encountered the full extent of the communist cruelty against their own people was in Hawaii, where you know, I interviewed people on the run, I interviewed people I went to the um, Lucy Kwokok in, 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 in Hawaii, which uh, as you know was the, the, this famous high school founded by um, President Jim's father. Uh, so can you describe for me what, what day you get there and what did you see and what happened? To, to Hue? Yeah, to Hue. Okay. I flew from um, on a military flight, the first military flight out of Saigon uh, that I could get a seat on uh, after Tet in Saigon. Tet in Saigon was, you know, is where it started. And I arrived the night before Tet in Saigon. Uh, because I'd been tipped off uh, by friends in Laos that something like that was going to happen. And um, I flew uh, to Da Nang, spent the night there, and then um, took a, uh, joined a convoy of American Marines to, um, from Da Nang to, to Fubai. Um, and uh, in Fubai, they were regrouping the Marines, and then they, they went from... They moved in from the south to Hue. Fubai is 15, 16 kilometers from the center of Hue. Uh, it took us a full day to fight our way in, primarily because of um, a, there was a lot of sniper fire still, and, and, uh, and secondly, um, the roads, the road to Hue, or sections of that road, were covered with bodies, mainly women and children. Um, and I remember discussing this with a, an Austrian journalist working for a German newspaper or magazine and who was sort of sympathizing with the communists. And I said, well, your friends did that. You could see they, they, you know, they, they, they were festively clad in beautiful areas, um, women and children and the old guys. So, of course, it was Tet. And you could see from the wounds and from the way they had positioned themselves um, how um, they had been killed that they were killed at point-blank rage. They were assassinated. 
Um, so the communist or pro-communist uh, colleague of mine said, well, look, uh, this, they were obviously they killed, in, killed, killed in American airstrike. I said, you must be out of your mind. I spent World War II in air raid shelters in a burning city, and I know exactly what people look like when they've been killed by bombing. Uh, these people were point, killed point black. The women, and you could also see from the position of the women's corpses, how... Uh, they had tried to protect their children from getting killed by the Viet Cong. You could see that they, they, they lay in a sort of an art around, uh, around those kids. It was very touching, by the way. So that was the first experience. So then we arrived at um, MACV headquarters in, in, in Hue, which was on the south side of the River of Perfumes, and the, the new city of Hue, that was the European town, very French-looking part, um, uh, had more or less been liberated by the Americans. Although, there, and we, we spent the nights in, in this compound, which was a hotel in the old days, and um, we couldn't get out at night. That was impossible because there was a lot of enemy activities around. And if I might ever jump ahead, we I discovered that during that night uh, we slept in we slept on the floors on concrete floors um, between layers of body bags, uh, you know, sort of crap paper type body bags in which they carried fallen soldiers out. But these were body bags. The only way you could keep warm among. Vietnamese families, these were Vietnamese refugees who had fled to the Americans, many of them uh, civil servants, other uh, uh, people working with the Americans, women and children, men. And I slept between two Vietnamese families on the ground, and in the middle of the night, I was, was awakened, I had a brrrr, you know, boom. And the guy lying next to me said to me in French, um, that's a Vietnamese man, this is an execution. So I said, uh, how do you know the difference? He said, well, you hear one gun, it's one gun, it's shooting one direction. You can t tell the difference between, say, an American M16 rifle and the uh, communist Kalashnikov rifles. Uh, and that was a Kalashnikov sound, and I heard that too. I mean, that much I was familiar with now. And uh, he said it was one and there were five. Brum, 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 brum. He said somebody got executed. Years later, um, in 2008, I came here to Southern California and ran into a, a, a guy, a, a gentleman by the name of Tontati. And um, we would, he told me that his father, who was the former mayor of Dalat, um, and his uncle and three cousins had um, been executed that night. And we traced the place, and the house was um, about 100 yards away. So obviously what I heard was that execution. And then, you know, there are always, in, in wars, you even have funny events, even when something as tragic as that happened. And so I fell back to sleep, and suddenly I felt something warm and fat crawling under my blankets, which were body bags, and furry. And it was a, a goose. The Americans called him Garfield. And that goose had fled with all the Vietnamese civilians into the American compound. And he was a little nuts, the goose, obviously. Um, and, but he usually, geese are great watchdogs. We know that from the story of Rome. Um, and he normally had his position on the wall surrounding, um, uh, surrounding this. And he peeked out to see if anything, everything was okay. When that, that assassination happened, he got scared, and he suddenly crawled under my bed for safety. So I said, well, look, I, to him, I said to him, listen, I like geese for Christmas, you know, with dumplings and, uh, and red cabbage. I, don't, I like you inside my belly, but not on top of it, so will you please go back to your position? Um, so that was that. Then the next morning, um, I went to, uh, along the Laloi Boulevard, which sort of hugged the southern shore of the River Perfumes. 
in the direction of the Cité Universitaire, where, the, um, where my friends, the German professors, medical professors, had lived. I knew that they had been kidnapped. And so I went in uh, into their apartment in the Cité Universitaire. And I think Professor Kreinig, who was the dean, the founder of the medical school, uh, these were civilians, by the way. They had nothing to do with the military. They were, he was a good Catholic. He wanted to help people, and so he gave up his tenure professorship at the University of Freiburg to come there, and his wife. Um, and there was an American platoon stationed in there. Of course, they were combat-weary, as you would be after the heavy fighting. Um, and outside the building was a tank, an American tank, lobbing rounds of fire into, uh, uh, into a beautiful old French, French colonial villa on the other side of the canal. Um, and the walls shook. And this professor had um, a beautiful collection of behind glass paintings. And I went in and I took those off the wall because I didn't want them to fall down. It was high investment. And uh, the American lieutenant, the platoon leader, who was from um, New Mexico, I was about 23 years old. Um, Remember his name? No, unfortunately not. Uh, you know, a, I'm 77, so uh, names are the first things that, uh, you know, if, if you go nuts, then that's just the first thing that goes is your memory of names, at least mine. Um, but I know he was from New Mexico, I remember that, and I remember that he was a fool because he had stripped to his t-shirt, and the t-shirt was white, and he wore no helmet and no flak jacket. And he walked past the open glass door out to the balcony. And on the other side, there was a target, and they had snipers in that villa. That's what the tank was firing at. And I said, Lieutenant, you, uh, you are highly irresponsible, you know. Um, you are attracting fire. Uh, you, he said, sir, I'm a Marine. Where I'm trained to fight and die. And I said, no, you're a fool because uh, the American government or American taxpayer paid $500,000, invested $500,000 in you not to um, lose you in combat and the leadership of a platoon over something as stupid, as brazen as that. And he said, you're insulting me and I'm a Marine. So I said, well, so I said, you can't deal with this fool, sir. Eventually went down having taken those paintings down, went down the stairs, at which point I heard this horrendous scream. And the guy came falling out, holding his chest. And he tumbled down, um, he tumbled down the steps and was dead. And then the entire platoon went bananas, went bankrupt, uh, crazy. Um, these are things you cannot forget. Anyway, the Germans were then, as you know, four of them, three doctors and the wife of one of the doctors um, were murdered by the Viet Cong after six weeks in captivity. There could not have been any, um, any doubt that they had been German doctors and none other. Uh, and the communists claimed, when I was later in, in, in a Paris peace conference in 1969, asked a uh, Viet Cong journalist, I ran into a Viet Cong journalist, um, who had been in Hawaii during the Tet Offensive. And he said, uh, well, you know, they were, they, they were all, um, uh, they were all um, working for the Americans, they were American spooks, all oh, that, all that. And they said, no, it was actually uh, the, the, the CIA who murdered them just to make the Vietnamese people angry against, um, against us. This nonsense. The German government, the European governments, the... Um, uh, Everybody, the French, had pleaded with uh, Hanoi to spare these people, nothing else. But this was, uh, this was bad for me as a, as a German. Obviously, these were friends, and, and many other German friends died there because the, this is important for this story too, um, because the East Germans had claimed that West Germany was um, fighting, has a, had a legion of soldiers fighting in, in American uniforms. Sometimes they went as far as to say two divisions, which is nonsense. No West Germans were, were there. You had, of course, German soldiers 
in American uniforms, they were immigrants, you know, like anybody else. Um, and the communist propaganda in Vietnam, Radio Hanoi, and then the, um, I think it was called Radio Jai Phong, um, Viet Cong um, a radio station, keep, kept claiming it day after day after day, so no German was safe. There were, um, there were German helpers of the Knights of, Knights of Malta, the relief organization, the Catholic Noble Order, Knights of Malta. And um, they came, they were nurses, they were looking after children, that sort of thing. They were kidnapped, walked up the Ho Chi Minh Trail, three of them died, two wound up in the Hanoi Hilton uh, for four years. But when Huey happened, I then went from that, uh, the home of the Germans, I went to the, um, uh, to the university auditorium and the place was full of refugees. And somebody pulled, and they all avoided my, my, my eyes. They didn't want to look at me because they were scared that talking to me, somebody might, uh, might have over observed them and said to the Viet Cong, look, here's another guy who dealt with Americans because they, I wore a uniform. Um, they thought I was an American. Not that I think it made any difference in those days. They were, they were so nuts. Um, but one guy who spoke a very elegant, educated French pulled me to the side. And he didn't identify himself, but he, uh, it was clear that he must have been a professor. I mean, he, sp he spoke French so well. Um, so he told me how the Viet Cong, pardon me, had or in North Vietnamese, had come in with lists with names and had gone from door to door with lists and taken those people out and in, in sort of revolutionary tribunals, uh, took them out, 10 minute trial, they couldn't defend themselves, and then took them out and shot them. You know, they sent us thousands. Um, so I said to him, Professor, he didn't mind being called a professor, uh, how come you're alive? He said, well, go down to the psychiatric ward, um, which is where you will see the saddest part of this whole thing. I had fled, fled to the psychiatric ward, and the, the, um, the patients when the Viet Cong attack by the fire design went absolutely nuts. They were totally disoriented, didn't know what was going on. It was the saddest thing he said to see these poor people who had no means, intellectual means, because they were, uh, they were mentally ill. Um, these poor people went berserk, didn't know which way to turn, the Viet Cong mowed them down. And I said, but then the Viet Cong realized that they were nuts. Um, and I said, and, and what did you do? He said, well, I pretended I was nuts. And this is how I survived. I played crazy. Nancy, these are memories that you will never forget. If you, as, a, as, a, as, a journalist, as a journalist, you live these memories probably much better, um, uh, uh, much more intensively. Than, uh, than as a regular person. Now, the, the next thing that happened was I took um, uh, again, the professor said, go over to the Lycée Quarkock. Now, you know the history of the Lycée Quarkock. This was this fabulous school uh, founded by uh, Ziem's father, President Ziem's father, um, to teach Vietnamese imperial princes and other nobles um, both the Western culture and the Conf Conf Confucianist um, uh, culture. Some of the Ho Chi Minh attended that school, Xiem attended that school, Pham Van Dong, the North Vietnamese Prime Minister. It was an extremely elegant campus, and I had known this before, I've been there before. Um, there were 8,000 people in, on that campus, all driven from their homes, um, hungry. There, were, there was no water, there was no food. Um, they didn't know where to uh, relieve themselves. Um, it was 
incredible. So then on the way back to the compound, I walked past a very interesting sign, which I used in my text. <coughs> um, you, you went, I went past a villa, and there were many of those, with a graffito that used to be cut off up. Uh, cut, um, uh, we had the, the French. That had been painted over, and well, not cut on me, it was American. And now it was cut, uh, painted over, and it said, even then, it was in the height, at the height, in the height of the uh, Tet Offensive, cut the Ocon, kill the communists. Very interesting that, and I found this quite remarkable that people actually had the guts to do that. And then the next day or two days later, I went into heavy combat. I crossed um, the, the river with a platoon of American Marines, and um, it was house, house to house combat. And I attached myself to a strapping, tall, black American a Marine. Very good fighter, nice guy. And, you know, in those days, house to house fighting, you, uh, the bad guys are in the houses and they aim their guns, train their guns at you. And the only thing you can do is um, to throw yourself to the ground and then spray the windows with automatic rifle fire to keep them inside. And then his weapon jammed, which had M16 hop, uh, happened to, uh, very frequently in Vietnam because uh, it was too uh, sensitive to the climate and the humidity and all that sort of thing. And so the guy took his hand grenade, threw it into the house. And then the next thing you know was that uh, the door opened and a woman came out with her dead ba uh, baby in her arms. And this American Marine said, oh my God, oh my God, whatever, I done, I killed a little baby. He went like a dervish, he rotated like a dervish, and his deputy platoon leader had to throw him to the ground and hold him down because he would have obviously been killed because you know, the Viet Cong kept shooting. And then I decided, well, then they took him away, they gave him an ejection, type of and he was, he was no longer capable to fight. Uh, and at that point I decided to go back and to, uh, to leave that unit and off the 53 Marines in that platoon by the t who had left the compound at um, 3 o'clock in the morning. By 3 o'clock in the afternoon, f 10 were alive or standing. 43 had been either killed uh, or badly wounded. At least they weren't there. So you're talking about you come in here with a platoon, Marine platoon. Uh, do you remember the... Um, you know, commander, uh, you hear the no. name of Chuck Meadows? They said you wrote the same program? I don't know. Okay. Sorry, Nancy. Uh, you know, you're, you're talking to a geezer here. <laughs> I'm a, I, I, have a <laughs> I have very bad memory. I, mean, I remember some of the Vietnamese the names. Um, later, for example, I was quite friendly uh, with first colonel, then later brigadier general Lan, who was the yeah. commander of the South Vietnamese Marines, and a number of others. Um, uh, and, but uh, I, I can't remember yet, my okay. now. I mean, I can't remember the name, I'm quite sure. Uh, if I met him face to face, I would see. So uh, you have a chance to visit uh, Phu Cam uh, Cathedral in Hue? Yes. What did you see? Not during that time, sorry, not during the uh, battle. Uh, I've been in, in previous visits. I've been to, uh, to, to, to so I didn't see very much. Then other than the, the cathedral, where there was a Catholic church. But, uh, during that battle, I didn't go. And, uh, I didn't go anywhere close to it. You know. Could you be, uh, you will have an opportunity to visit La San Brothers uh, School there? Uh, no. La San Brothers School, uh, Catholic School. La, the La Salle Brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, no. 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 Uh, so you, uh, in your book, you wrote about you were uh, witness uh, the body of uh, uh, three professor, medical professor, and uh, wife of one of those yeah. professors. Uh, what did you see? Can you describe it? Well, um, I, I saw them. I went up to Huey to um, uh, to identify the body, and um, the uh, the impression was 
by medical people that they had, the, from the position they were in a, in a mass grave, um, that they had been forced to kneel down, had uh, arms bound with wire behind their backs, and then be, be, been shot through the back of the head um, and dropped into the, the, this thing. This is just what we saw. But it was very clear, I mean, that this was a, an entrance wound here and an exit wound here, the place was going up. Um, and they looked in a horrible condition, the body is also emaciated, you know. And these were strapping people, I mean, these were sporty people who, who kept trim and, and, you know, they were doctors, they knew how to handle bodies, their own bodies. Um, that's what I saw. Um, but I didn't. I didn't see who come. I went in. Uh, I went as far as I could at the time uh, into the combat, and then I withdrew um, because I felt as at some point you have to get out when the, while the going is good. And I'd like to describe this because I, I came back to Hawaii a few days later. Um, I came down. And on the northern bank of the river, I ran into a landing zone, helicopter landing zone. And there, must, there were hundreds of American and Vietnamese, but many American soldiers, wounded, terribly wounded. And they couldn't flee. Um, they have been flown out. And the, this major in charge of this LZ said, uh, not, the weather is too bad. I said, no, the weather is not too bad. They didn't, weren't flown out because they didn't want to call army helicopters. I mean, there are some pretty stupid things happened there too, as you might imagine. Um, and I just said, you know, by that time, you must imagine I was there for days. You can see that in my condition in this picture. I stank. I stank of dead bodies. I stank of putrefying bodies. And I stank. I couldn't smell my, stand my own smell. Uh, and I just had to get out because I wanted to keep my sanity. And I went um, and I saw an LCT, the landing craft, the South Vietnamese Navy landing craft, about to take off and heading east down the river. And I said, well, take with me with, me with you, I want to go. Um, and there was a very nice, he looked like a Cherokee Indian, this Vietnamese guy with leather face, a leathery face, a lovely guy, a good sense of humor too. He said, come aboard. And, um, and then we sailed down the river and took an enormous amount of incoming fire, the ricocheting of the, of the hull of the ship that didn't cause any injuries. And it came from the two banks, especially from the northern bank. Um, and then I fell asleep. I hadn't slept properly for, for, day, for days on end. Um, and then in the middle of the night, he landed somewhere. There was an American base. And I, can, I think I was then, I, 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 by the time I was myself nuts, um, I was taken um, by a helicopter to Da Nang, where we had the German hospital ship. And I first um, went to the press center I, had, I wore three sets of fatigues on top of each other because it was so cold. Um, and I stank of death. And I stubble. So I shaved, I washed, I showered, I showered, I showered. I don't know how many showers I took to get the smell of me. And then uh, I had two dry martinis and went to sleep, then found my stories to put telephone us into. Uh, my colleagues, uh, I had a colleague from the same company in Saigon who acted as my copy taker. And um, then I said, I, I, you know, for once you want, I have enough of this war, enough of the Americans, <laughs> enough of the Vietnamese. I just want out, I want some sanity. And there was this German ship. So I went to the German ship and I wanted to have a decent German meal. And the ship, you know, these lovely nurses, a wonderful, feisty, uh, she said, oh, well, they said, oh, well, you have to have a meal, you have to rest up, have a good drink, have some fun with us, listen to some good music. Um, and the next thing I knew, you know, the, the, the ship tooted its horn and it left shore and we went to 
international waters for the night so as not to be attacked overnight. And then I came back the next morning. My, by that time, my, my uniforms had been cleaned. Um, and I, um, I then took a helicopter ride back to Fubai, back to Hue. And as I arrived in Hue, and this is very essential here for our story, um, my friend Peter Braestrup, he was the um, correspondent for the um, Washington Post. Very nice guy. He said, Uwe, you must come with us. They just found a mass grave. On the northwestern side of Hue. And a truck came by, a military truck, and picked us up and took us there. It was still heavy fighting. A Viet Cong flag um, was still on the citadel, flying on the citadel. And there were, um, I don't know, maybe a thousand, maybe more bodies in there. Mainly women and children. And you could see from the position of those bodies that the women, some of the women were still alive. In fact, this is how they found the mass grave, because the women had, you know, they all had for Ted manicured their fingernails. And they tried to claw their way out of the grave and died. And they found the hands, the fingers, sticking out of the ground. And there was an American television team, and I can't recall which channel it was, and I don't want to, I, have a, I think I know, but I don't want to say it now because simply because I don't want to uh, accuse somebody falsely just because I'm not sure which, t which t um, network it was. And they walked about without shooting this picture, without f filming this. So Peter Braestrup said to her, why don't you, um, uh, to the cameraman, why aren't you filming this? Uh, this is the most blatant evidence for horrendous war crimes that have been committed there. And this fool answered, we are not here to spread anti-communist propaganda. Go figure, as the Americans say. Um, so that, and then we, I went back to Saigon, uh, and there was still heavy fighting. Um, on both fronts, one in the southwestern uh, suburbs of Saigon, another one further to the southeast. And so I covered those, um, and then flew home. My home was then uh, Hong Kong. And my wife, Jillian, picked me up at, um, uh, at Kai, Kai Tak Airport with my dog, Schnudel. And um, she was very beautiful, my wife. Uh, she was, she was sort of strapping her son, ten legs, I mean, even, even though it was in the winter, and she was a tennis player and all that sort of thing. And we had a wonderful meal. And then she said in the evening, uh, why is it you, can't, you don't even kiss me properly, you don't even touch me? And I couldn't. I had the smell of death in my head, and I just didn't want to, dis uh, to, to sully her, you know. I've, it took me days to become, to get close to my own wife, simply because of this memory. And now, at the age of 77, as I was writing this book, I had nightmares against smelling putrefaction in, in, in my nose. That, that was actually one of the results of uh, writing this book. So that was, uh, this was my Hui story. I mean, there are many other uh, stories of Tet Offensive in Saigon, but then you, you will ask me about them. Yes. So do you fa uh, follow up uh, with the story of the four German, I mean three uh, prof uh, German professor, medical professor? Yeah. What happened? The government, uh, German uh, government did anything to investigate about? Well, they uh, must have. At, at first they didn't honor, I think, uh, honor them sufficiently, but there was an investigation. But somehow it was swept underground um, because we're talking 1968, and uh, 1968 was also, as you know, a, a year of great upheaval in Europe. And you had these, we call them, this, well, the French call them the 68 and then the French call them the 68ers or the 68ers, um, who were, you know, flying Viet Cong flags and, and, and marching down the streets, uh, uh, chanting Ho 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 Chi Minh. And I always had the feeling that our government 
um, at the time was didn't find it prudent um, to do too much about the murder of these Germans, um, simply because of the the atmosphere uh, on German campuses, very much very similar to what happened in the United States. I covered that as well. Um, I'm then, of course, when the when was the following year? No, a few months later, the uh, the Viet Cong murdered the, the number two man at the German embassy, point blank, at same range, made him kneel down, tied his hand, boom, dead. Even though the guy had diplomatic license plates on his car, he, he drove around uh, Cholon mainly, and other parts of the, the uh, surrounding uh, arrondissements of Saigon to collect German residents. We had a pretty large contingent of civilians there, you know, German cultural entities, cultural, Goethe Institute, which is a cultural institute. We had uh, uh, German help building up, for example, the South Vietnamese Trade Union and all sorts of things. So, and his, this was a, his name was Hans, Hasso Rüth von Kohlenberg. I was a, I came from a very old noble family, ancient noble family. And um, he was stopped by the Viet Cong, and he showed his diplomatic passport and shouted at them in French uh, that he was a German diplomat. It didn't help him. They killed him. Um, and I was very upset at first that the German government had not honored him sufficiently, because he was a very brave man, really was brave, he was, and he was very knowledgeable of Vietnamese affairs, and he spent all through the Tet Offensive, he had a, had a, um, uh, a bed or a bunk in, in his office uh, in, the, in the embassy, and then went about all night making sure that people were safe. I am happy to report now, I've checked this out in, in the new edition, it's there, that uh, the German, there's now a plaque of honor in the minister's wing of the German Foreign Office, which honors all the diplomats who had fallen uh, or been killed or murdered um, in pursuit of their mission to, to fight tyranny. And so he, his name and his plaque is, is, is there alongside those German diplomats who fought the Nazis in World War II and were, were executed by the Nazis, beheaded by the Nazis. So I think that's a proper, and that is also a, a proper place to do, proper thing to do, because it was absolutely analogous to, the, um, to what the Germans in the resistance suffered. Uh, from the Nazis. Same thing, uh, totalitarians murdering decent people. Can you provide us with a picture of the names on those blacks? I can't provide you with a picture of the name. I mean, um, it is, if I, I might be able, I'm going to be in Germany in March. If I can find it, and I can ask my German diplomat friend if they can. I mean, I, the name I can give you, okay, the name is Hassel. Yeah, I will ask you to spell that for me later. Um, oh, yeah. But, yeah, but I'll provide you with a name. Yeah. But um, whether I can get that picture, I would have to ask um, a former German diplomats living in, in Berlin now to get, uh, uh, or German foreign office get the plan. But it's, um, it's very important. But there were others who died. I mean, it's, it's, you know, these guys went absolutely wild. I mean, imagine a girl, a woman, her name was Monica Schwinn, being taken up to the Hanoi Hilton, kept in the solitary confinement for the, and having to, uh, they wanted to, her to confess her crimes against the Vietnamese people. She said, well, I hell with it. I'm not, I haven't committed any crimes. I came here to, to, to uh, take care of your wounded and sick children, regardless of whether they were pro-Viet Cong, the parents were pro-Viet Cong, any, anybody who came my way needed help, which is my mission as a, as a medical person. Um, then there's another guy, um, doctor, he's now a doctor, Bernard Deal. And in his distress, they were denied reading materials. They were for four years, can you imagine that? Um, he wrote poems, 
6,000 verses. And when they were finally released, along with the American uh, prisoners, uh, Theodobos, the director of the, 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 that, that, that jail of Anoy Hilton took his 6,000 poems off him. That's the only thing, the guy is, the guy is still distraught over it. He has been fighting since the end of the Vietnam War um, to get these pictures back. The big picture of his verses, which is, you know, his capital. And they are so petty-minded, these communists. They cannot admit that they made a mistake. They can't even admit that they had mistreated foreigners whose sole crime was to have, have treated Vietnamese civilians. Or anybody, for that matter. I mean, if a Viet Cong soldier had fallen into their hands, wounded, they would have treated him, as for doctors do. That's the, um, uh, that is the commitment of doctors and nurses and people like that. And there was uh, assorted other things. I mean, I was a, the Viet Cong kidnapped in Hue during the Tet Offensive um, a professor of conducting orchestra, the head of the um, conservatory of Hue, of the German. Fortunately, they didn't murder him. But they held him prisoner. And the guy, the guy taught Vietnamese people, who are very talented musicians, how to conduct an orchestra, he gets kidnapped. So that is the one side that I found very disturbing. And of course, you might ask me, you know, the, the other yeah. most horrible experience will be something else that I'll discuss with you later. Yeah. So um, I don't understand, and probably you, most of the young people now don't understand that, you know, for American press, you know, they, uh, because of they don't want to go into the trap or they have their relative during war, so they don't want a war because they don't want those people get hurt, get killed. Yeah. But what about the European country? A student, I mean, university, uh, what's wrong with them? Why they have uh, anti, um, you know, uh, Vietnam War, uh, and then uh, turn the public opinion against South uh, Vietnam and America? Yeah. Well, it was, in, in, in the case of America, it was primarily I believe, um, the work of one particular section of the media okay? and, and academia. Um, in the case of Europe, it was not so much, I mean, we had some stupid left-wing publications, but most of uh, the correspondents that I met, German correspondents that I met out there and editors, uh, were very balanced um, and they did a very good job of reporting. But you had 1968 was a, an uprising that started in Paris. And um, let's not forget that the left bank and the Sorbonne had been the source of left-wing activity. If you would jump ahead, just uh, the Holocaust in, 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 um, in Cambodia uh, was caused and led by people uh, they called in French the Caniche de Paul Pot, the, the, the Jean Paul Sartre, Jean Paul Sartre's um, poodles. Paul Pot had been a follower of Jean Paul Sartre. So they, there, there was this demented um, French academic um, left wing agitation which infected the, an, an entire generation of students, and that swept over to Germany where for similar reasons and some other reasons, which had to do with also trying to um, deflect their own uh, country's uh, history, uh, which wasn't very good. Um, so it was that. And then you had the exchanges come over across the Atlantic. And suddenly people uh, like Daniel Ellsworth, uh, uh, Ellsworth and all these people who uh, um, who had agitated against the Vietnamese, uh, the South Vietnamese and the Vietnam commitment, that affected the rest of the world. Um, I would not say that it was, that this applied to the majority of the West Germans, uh, and not to the majority of the, the French either, but these were the most prominent major. 
and they couldn't understand. You see, it was very difficult even for me, even in, in a conservative newspaper, which I worked for, um, to, for example, describe, I did in the end, but to describe what I thought was most, the most uh, compelling evidence for, um, uh, for Viet Cong crimes, and that was in a, in a small hamlet in central Vietnam, um, where, and I had joined a South Vietnamese um, army unit, and we were, we were called in the middle of the night to that village, and which had been visited by the Viet Cong. Do you remember the name of the village? No. Uh, no, and I wish I did. Um, and in fact, it's very sad because I, I met an American, um, now a lieutenant colonel, but in those days he was a captain, who also had been there, and we can't remember the village. It was small, it was a tiny place. But we came in, it was in Binion province, I think. We came in, in the middle of the night, and the village had been visited by um, by a Viet Cong unit. And we found in the center of the village, hanging from trees, the mayor, the mayor's wife, and 12 children. And the mayor and his male, his sons, had their uh, um, genitals cut off. And first, they, uh, he had his tongue cut off. And then he had um, uh, his genitals stuffed into the mouth. And then he was hanged. And the women had their breasts cut off. And I interviewed uh, uh, an elderly gentleman there in this village who spoke French quite well. And I said, what happened here? And he said, well, the mayor had been loyal to Saigon. And uh, the Viet Cong came in every night or every other night and said, if you don't stop them, you'll suffer the uh, consequences. So finally, and he remained loyal to Saigon, um, so finally they came in and then woke everybody in the village and they had to be, had to assemble around this sort of village square and they had to watch them methodically execute um, these people. First the children and then all the way up, all in front of their parents. Okay. Um, you can find the, a description of this um, uh, in, Nixon's, in uh, President Nixon's book, The Real War, um, where he, Nixon is quoting me, in fact. A pretty long story in that, where he described very much like uh, like uh, French eyewitnesses back in the first in the China War, he described the real purpose of this, and this is because of the way the Viet Cong won, or the Communist won, was simply by terror. Um, and here is an analogy, Nancy, um, which you might find interesting. In 1965, that's before this happened. I traveled to North Vietnam, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to Hue, and then took a, then visited the International Control Commission's camp up in, um, at the Benhai River the border. And on, his way, on the way back, I uh, got talking, I realized suddenly this, uh, the driver was Vietnamese. A spoke very good French, but he also spoke German. Because, the, because he'd learned it from the French Foreign Legion and there were many German soldiers. And then he tells me a story uh, which I actually wanted to turn into a novel, but I didn't have the time since then, how the Viet Cong, um, the Viet Minh at the time, had committed a similar crime. And this guy, uh, uh, he witnessed it, and, uh, and one child, one boy, had, had dropped to the ground, pretended to be dead, and the villagers stepped in front of him to shield him against the Viet Cong, and he sneaked out. And the next time that uh, happened, he, the next thing that happened to him, he found himself lying under something big and warm, 
and it was a water buffalo. And then he crawled out from under the water buffalo and, um, and was surrounded by young boys. And all of them were um, orphans. And he said, no, you're, you've lost your family, you are now your family. And these water buffaloes, these buffalo boys, which were very much an important feature in the French countryside, riding those water buffaloes and minding them, you see, and they had their own culture. And anyway, he became part of this culture, which is an interesting story in itself, it is like maybe for another day. But he described a, a crime identical to the one, the results of which I saw uh, a few months later in, 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 uh, in, in 1965. Um, so it was method, and the frightening thing is, this always was known. Um, if you read Bernard Fall's famous book, The Two Vietnams, you will find how the French operated, uh, the, uh, the Viet, Viet Minh operated and won the war with terror. There was terror, they, they, they terrorized the Vietnamese people into submission to their own discipline. And another thing that I think where I fooled many of my American colleagues is, but it's in connection with it, I ne we never saw people flee in the direction of the communists. You know, um, in, when Vietnam was divided, 1954, 130,000 communists went north, 800,000 to a million northerners came south. And this was the case throughout. And even at the very end, in 1975, I wasn't there at the time, but I know this from my ports, um, at the very end, refugees were fleeing in the directions of South Vietnam and the government. The government and the Americans, of course, in 1975, there were no Americans left. Uh, and I think this is one of the key elements. We are talking about a conquest, a communist conquest, a totalitarian conquest of a f relatively free and democratic country. It had its flaws, uh, but a relatively free country by terror and um, war crimes. And war crimes committed as a part of strategy against international law whereas the war crimes committed by, uh, by the Americans were committed against, uh, um, against American law and were prosecuted. Maybe not sufficiently, but they were prosecuted. Um, and this has to be, in history, in history, and it has to be taught, we are dealing with terror here. Same terror as, we, uh, uh, and I tell you what, Vongo um, Njab, the, the North Vietnamese defense minister, predicted or said um, to the political commissars, I think it was 116th Division of the, the enemy, meaning the West, is not psychologically and politically equipped to fight a protracted war. And guess what? He was right. And now uh, Al-Qaeda and others have learned their lesson from Bung Rinjab. As we know now, in, uh, in, in the case of Fallujah in Iraq, or God forbid, what's going to happen when when uh, when the Western part of NATO withdraws from uh, from Afghanistan? How many people? And it, you know, and then of course, no, no American correspondents. They don't, so they won't cover the mass murder, the slaughter of women, the executions, and all that sort of thing. Uh, in 1972, were you still there when the story about Captain Kali and the Milai village? Um, I, I was there when the story broke. I didn't go to Milai. Um, but wait a minute, well, that wasn't 72, it was earlier, wasn't it? Anyway, oh, it was 69, 1969. 69, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, wasn't, I know when the story broke, and I covered um, the Kelly trial in Fort Benning, Benning because of my official position was then North American correspondent for Stern magazine. And so that, uh, obviously, I kept an eye on things Vietnamese and uh, 
operating out of New York and Washington. So I was down at the, at the trial um, and at the verdict, you know, which uh, uh, was there. So, um, and I had seen minor versions of what they had done too, and uh, I'll be happy to discuss my views on that, and also where it differs from, I mean, there's, there's no excuse for it to start with, I mean, and I'm not an apologist for, for what they have done. But there's an explanation. The explanation is twofold. You had, by that time, a, a distinct drug culture among American forces. You also didn't have the best leadership anymore. Um, and the first military rank to die in combat uh, is normally, especially in those days, was normally the uh, platoon leader, lieutenant. Um, and so the, there was an attrition rate, it was it, tremendous. This not only in the American forces, but it was prevalent in, in the American forces. It was in World War II on the German side too. Uh, life expectancy of a platoon leader uh, was very low, um, and one reason was that in those days the, you, you could hit a platoon leader very easily if you were on the other side, because he was the guy who walked next to the radio man, you see, and so the, the Viet Cong could spot the, the aerial or the antenna of uh, the radio man, and they aimed there and they got the platoon leader as well. Um, and to replenish their officers' corps, especially at a time of anti-war um, uh, anti sentiment here in the United States, they had to grab whatever they got. I'm not even sure that Kelly had actually finished college. I mean, he would not... The guy, from what I saw during testimony and heard of him and, and what he said, the way he behaved, um, was no officer material. I mean, I wouldn't have made him sergeant. You know, uh, much less an officer. But this is this this has to be borne in mind. You did not have your most qualified officers anymore. Then uh, many units were bad. So you had a dysfunctional unit. Uh, as I said earlier, that he was uh, released. I think after three years, and he served these three years under house arrest and not in. in, in uh, in a military jail um, it was scandalous. That said, it was a different thing than uh, what happened in, um, uh, on the other side. Nobody uh, on the American side ordered or the, the higher ups, I'm talking the general or the headquarters in, in Saigon or God forbid, uh, the Pentagon ordered um, soldiers to commit rape and murder on a, on a massive scale. That was just not done. I mean, you know, the United States is a, a, a country of law, and it wasn't done. So it was a, a dysfunctional unit. On the North Vietnamese side, um, it was a clear sign a clear action according to the, the plans on guerrilla warfare, the, uh, the strategy devised by, um, uh, by uh, Wung Nguyen Siap and based on guerrilla warfare tactics developed by Mao Zedong. Uh, we all read when we were in Vietnam Siap's uh, uh, book, uh, People's War, People's Army where you could pretty much discern from that where, uh, what, how they conducted their war. Uh, and it was policy. Flew in the face of, um, of the Geneva Conventions on, on land warfare, flew in the face of civilization, flew in the face, I think, of, uh, of uh, the Vietnamese tradi uh, cultural traditions, which have very high standards, for God's sake. I mean, you know, we are a Confucian society. You don't do this. Uh, you think that a uh, good soldier, and he, um, I mean, carry his duty 
honestly, or are he a crazy man and stuff like that? You also say no, something. He was about a, no, it was, it, was, look, it was clear to those in the courtroom. And I, I, I was never a left wing uh, maniac or so, but it's very clear in the courtroom that, uh, that this guy was a substandard human being. You could see it. You can see his demeanor, uh, cocky, you know. Um, he had no idea of what he did. There's an American expression, poor white trash. All right? And Lieutenant Kelly was poor white trash, put in command of a... Um, of a unit that obviously wasn't uh, staffed for the best people, and that already had, uh, they didn't want to be in that war. By that time, the anti-war movement in the United States had uh, taken a hold of the mindset of many of the soldiers and their drug culture and all that sort of thing. And then they took revenge on a village because uh, they had, the village allegedly had shielded Viet Cong, whatever the reason was. And they did that, and they thought it could be done. Uh, and Kelly, I had no, uh, I, I remember sitting there with other colleagues in the, uh, among the press pew, in the press pew, said, yeah, how can a man of that low caliber ever be put in charge of 40 people with guns in their arms? But then see, that is what's happening at the tail end of a war. Um, you, uh, you, you, you don't have your gentlemen officers then anymore in, in units like that because gentlemen officers don't, you don't grow on the ground like, like carrots or, or radishes. They have to be raised properly. And, and they didn't have that anymore. There weren't enough there. Um, this was not the norm. It was not the norm among, uh, normal behavior among Americans. I mean, there were other war crimes committed. Um, but it was not the norm. It was the exception. And it was right to have him court martialed. It was not right to have him pardoned after three years or whatever it was um, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, on the house arrest. You know. So um, I would like to uh, have the opinion about the anti-war movement. Yes. Um, um, how, what do you think about, you know, they have the courage to uproot the flag of the enemy Why their, you know, relative, their loved one, their, I mean, uh, citizen going to the war against those people? Look, um, Prior to my going to Vietnam, I spent three years or something like that here in this country as correspondent already. You must understand that the 1960s had changed the mindset. And I'll get back to your question, but I want to explain to you um, what happened. Okay. Um, the, uh, and I have to tell you this as a j professional journalist judging um, fellow professional journalists. Okay. When I started out in, in journalism in the late 1950s, my first job was with the Associated Press in Germany, but it was an American outfit. We were taught, first of all, we learned the trade like a craft. It's not a university discipline, not an academic discipline, it's a craft, like plumbing or like butchering or carpentry or anything else. You have to have skills for that. And you don't clog your mind with ideology because the main fu function of a journalist is to, to keep an open mind and to ask questions. Now they want to change the world. This, all this happened in, uh, in the early 1960s when I was here, um, when suddenly the traditional, hard-working craftsman journalist who was taught to keep his opinion to himself, or her opinion, um, suddenly 
developed into somebody who wanted to teach the rest of the world. Now graduates from journalism schools like at uh, Columbia all say they wanted to become journalists in order to make this a better world. You don't become a journalist to make this a better world. Uh, Joseph Goebbels in, uh, and his uh, people in, in Germany wanted to make this a better world from their perspective, which wasn't a better world. It's not our job. You don't bake bread in order to make this a better world. You make bread, bake bread because you want to feed m a mouth. That's it. Same thing as butchering and anything else. This shift from um, a craft to a pseudo-academic discipline is what has destroyed um, much of um, uh, the American media since 19, the 1960s. 63 was a key year. Um, and has polluted the minds even today of students. And this came from liberal arts professors at colleges. You see, I went to university much later. I came out of high school and I immediately be, um, trained as a journalist. And I was curious. To, to this day, I'm curious. This is why I, I was so curious about Vietnam. I wanted to meet the Vietnamese people, for God's sake. I didn't want to see another hamburger chewing American. I met them all here, and I like them. I'm very fond of Americans. It's not that. But I wanted to see what the Vietnamese were like. And attractive people to be with, and, um, and interesting people, and quirky, and marvelous. So that was what, what has changed. It was the, primarily the influence of the liberal arts education. So the kids came out of high school, and instead of then training as a journalist, and therefore and learning how to keep their minds open, um, which is the beauty of it, nothing is better than curiosity, and you keep learning all sorts of things. They all became indoctrinated, and much of American academia in those, uh, since those days, maybe before that, but certainly in those days, uh, was leftist. Very heavy emphasis on Marxism and Leninism. So I mean, we had that. Then it was the me, me culture. Now it's the me, me, me culture. The me culture started with people like Timothy Leary, uh, the drug culture pleasure seekers. They didn't want to be troubled. And this was a bother in Vietnam. Our people are finding we might get, uh, might get drafted, we might be sent to Vietnam. What do, do we care about the Vietnamese? And after all, aren't they, the communists good and progressive? I mean, I know this. I, look, I covered the, the, the university lives here and the campuses. It was all over. And the same thing in, Euro in Europe, but more in America. Um, and it is, uh, it is still, you notice that now you cannot really, uh, you don't get a decent international coverage in American media. Why? Because people are no longer curious. When I started, we all learned languages. American correspondents came to Germany, uh, spoke fluent German. When they were transferred to, Fran to France, they sat down and learned French, as, as it behooved you, in order to understand these people. This is no longer the case. They don't have correspondence there anymore. Nothing. There's no curiosity. So you cannot understand the abject failure of, um, I think, the American media and the majority of the American media, not individual reporters. I want to make that point very clear. There were very, very courageous, decent American reporters out there. I spent a lot of time with them. They were wonderful people. Uh, but the abject failure of the media as a genre and as a, as a, um, is rooted in the um, in this sudden swift switch from trying to understand the news, trying to gather, the, collect the news with as open a mind as possible, and then report and let the readers be a judge. But in informed news, which also meant, uh, see, that they should have l read uh, books about it, books about Vietnam, about the culture, about uh, the former Indochina war, uh, um, uh, about the, the leaders of North Vietnam and South Vietnam. 
and, and, and the two major, uh, uh, not religions, but uh, well, religion, Buddhism, and, and of course Confucianism. So that is, that is where, we, where the trouble starts. And you go now to university. Now we find that young students um, are beginning to ask questions. I've been teaching um, uh, uh, journalism at, um, at Concordia University in Irvine and uh, focused uh, on the, Vietnamese, uh, the Vietnam debacle and uh, started an online newspaper about that. Now there are people who are asking these questions. At that time they didn't. It was so easy. Get, get high, find a girl, have sex, uh, smoke another, um, another joint and that sort of thing. And this is where I think um, the, uh, the Vietnamese became victimized by this shift in culture which is ongoing. People, Fallujah and in, in the future Afghanistan are victims of this same uh, mindset. And I fear very much as a result of my observations and as a result of uh, Jap's prediction that uh, democracies cannot, are not politically and psychologically equipped to fight a, a protracted war, that actually uh, in the end we might lose democracy in this country. It's not safe. It, they're uninformed. They don't know. They don't, they, don't, they don't know anything about foreign countries, foreign cultures, not even foreign cultures closer to theirs than Vietnam. I mean, there are ma many of, of European origin. They don't know anything about Europe here, um, the readers. And the journalists have no interest. It was totally different until then. So in Europe, uh, with the failure of the free war uh, to the communists, they took part of Germany, East Germany. Uh, do, that event don't wake up any, I mean, anti-war well, um, elements? Uh, well, uh, yes, obviously, I don't think there is uh, in Germany, listen, we've had now a conservative government for a relatively long time, and even the social democrats in Germany are not for communist. Um, and then, of course, you had something as there's a difference between the sad fate of Vietnam and the fortunate fate of Germany. Um, Vietnam, in Vietnam, what I think the wrong side won as a result of terror and by force of arms. Um, in Germany, the right side won as a result of the courageous peaceful um, revolution on, this, on the part of East Germans, East German civilians, regular people. Um, and then f at the time, of course, you had wise statesmen uh, in America, first Reagan, and then, of course, at the time of reunification, Bush, the elder Bush, the father, uh, in, 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 in Soviet Union, Gorbachev. And in, uh, in Germany, Helmut Kohl, who made this possible. Um, in the United States at the time of Vietnam, well, the worst aspect or part were played in addition to the media and, 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 and the universities, the academia, um, was of course Congress that ultimately delivered um, South Vietnam uh, to its butchers. Um, and you will f be hard pushed today, and you will be hard pushed next year when we come to the 40th anniversary, to find a serious discussion in the American media of the people who died as a result of this betrayal. That between 200 and 400,000 boat people drowned, civilians all that um, that about a million people went into a concentration camp, 165,000 uh, at least were, uh, died in, in captivity, mainly uh, tortured to death. That 100,000 South Vietnamese soldiers and uh, civil servants were executed right afterwards. I mean, 
there is this horrendous number of people whom the United States Congress and the media delivered on a plate to the butchers. And then, what they don't tell you is this, that there was a precedent for this. Ho Chi Minh, who had never been a freedom fighter in the, in the sense we understand the term, he had been, since the early 1920s, a cadre of the Comintern, the Communist International of Moscow. He delivered French national, uh, Vietnamese nationalists, VNQDD people, others, royalists, and others, first to the French, or he had them murdered himself. And then when finally, in 53, I mean, he was pretty much running the northern end of Vietnam, and between 53 and 56, do you know how many people perished in the land reforms? 200, between uh, 200 and 400,000 land reforms, and maybe up to 500,000 landowners had committed suicide in order not to be tortured to death by the communists. All this was known, by the way, it's, it's, it's long uh, texts written, good books written about it, and they were available at the time when I came to Vietnam, there was no secret about this. Ho Chi Minh himself, when, when he was asked late in his life uh, what he had really been fighting for in Vietnam, he didn't say to reunify the country or to liberate the country, as he called it. He said in order to further the victory of Marxism and Leninism in the world. And that was precisely what we were fighting. So, they were fighting Americans, they were fighting us Germans, they were fighting the French, the British, everybody else, and of course the South Vietnamese, and the South Vietnamese were the ones who were fed to the dogs. Um, or, as I write in my book, Americans threw them away like a half-eaten donut. Um, that I find is something that Americans, American academia and American media have to uh, re wrestle with from now on because it's a historical burden. As we Germans and others have historical burdens we have to wrestle with. Um, and we have to do it as, as uh, honorably and decently and, and, and civilly as possible, but it has to be done. So, um, can you explain, you know, uh, we read the, Amer uh, the book written by American author or historian. It looked like they um, criticized heavily uh, to um, Lenin, Stalin, uh, Mao. Somehow they uh, braised Ho. Ho looked so nice. Uh, Uncle Ho. Wasn't even his name. He had 170 names, though. Do you know that? 170 names. Oh, what's one of them? He looked nice. White beard, fluffy, sage. Nuts. And, and of course, you could not see. You could not see what Ho was doing to his people. You saw the goofiness of assorted South Vietnamese governments. And they, you know, they weren't always the brightest. Some of them were good, other were not so good. But they weren't criminal. They were just uh, you know, a bit of corruption, not as bad as any of the corruption. I mean, this is what I always makes me laugh when I hear him, uh, what a bunch of corrupt clowns the South Vietnamese government were. Uh, how can you say this with a straight face if you're living in a, in a country where one of the largest states of, of the last uh, seven uh, uh, governors, four are in jail for decades for corruption? Um, it was... It's ideology. If you set your mind, ideology, you cannot do. Any, you cannot deal with ideology, ideologues, because you cannot change their minds. I've known this. I've, I've, I've been in this discussion in so many instances in, in, acad in academic environments and elsewhere. Impossible. You can deliver the fact, and then they always say, "But Lieutenant Kelly and Milai." And you can't. Even, you can't relativize. That's another thing, you see. Uh, it's a mindset 
cliches, which by the way is one of the topics of my doctoral dissertation, is thinking in cliches, and the zeitgeist, you cannot actually dump, uh, debunk cliches. It's, it's crazy, at least not in the, the ivory, ivory towers of uh, academia. Um, and being Vietnamese, I mean, I, am, I commend you that you actually do what you're doing and, and actually try to set the record straight. I mean, I, I think the Vietnamese uh, community in this country and elsewhere in France as well, where I have uh, good connections and in Germany, um, they don't let up and that's good. Um, it, it will also ultimately be good for the, I think, for the future of the country because uh, if there's now a corrupt uh, society in Vietnam, it's a communist society. Yeah. Um, and at some point, hopefully peacefully, um, uh, another mindset will take over, and you people um, are doing a, a, a working wonders in that respect. So now, if uh, people ask you that, what is your most memory, uh, memorable? Um, event in Vietnam that you still is still with you. Well, I described two ways for you. That's obviously the most memorable. I described um, to you this this mass murder, the massacre in in this village in central Vietnam. Um, I describe can describe to you obviously on the positive side the beauty of the country. And I'm a man, I like the beauty of women too, so therefore I've described the beauty of the women, I described their elegance. Uh, and you will find this in chapter three um, of my book, where I um, pay homage to a Captain Nu, who was a district chief in Long Cot near the Cambodian border. Um, Captain Nu followed a um, followed a, a strategy devised by a very ma wise man who wasn't listened to in, in Washington and in, indeed in Saigon, but particularly in Washington. His name was Sir Robert Thompson. And Sir, Ro Sir Robert Thompson had started and led the British military mission, advisory mission to Vietnam, and he was the guy who had developed a successful strategy um, to fight communists in Malaya at the time. The Malayan uprising had just ended and the British and uh, the, the West won. And that was him. He was one, uh, one of the key uh, designers of this strategy. And here's what, what he said. Again, as a counterpoint, if you will, to what Wong Wen Ziap said. He said, if you want to win this war, you have to have patience. And you have to sec provide security to the people of Vietnam. Um, and all right, so may, let the communists take over bits, uh, big uh, blobs, but as long as you have uh, secured the, the individuals, they will be loyal to you. And I knew when I arrived in Vietnam, in Saigon, the first time that there had been a conflict uh, between a mindset of the impatient Americans, especially See, it's another thing, all these eggheads uh, like Robert McNamara, McGeorge Bundy, Dean Rusk, etc., who wanted to get this thing straight over with and who couldn't, didn't even see that, that what they were fighting, namely um, a proxy war of the Cold War, hot proxy war of the Cold War. Um, the Americans, that set of Americans, not the special forces, but that set, wanted to uh, search and destroy. In other words, slam bang, wall of boom, 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 lots of troops, lot of arms, Agent Orange, bombings, masses of forces, 500,000 in the end, over 500,000 in the end. And Thompson said, no, you have to clear and hold. That is, you take your time, you create 
uh, inlets and islands of, um, of safety and security, you provide them. And so before Thompson left Saigon, I went to see him and I said, asked his people, can you give me one area of South Vietnam where this strategy that you have devised, analogous to your strategy uh, in, in, uh, in Malaya, where this is at work? So I arrived in Longcourt, and the uh, a very tough old bird, he was uh, only a diary, he was a captain, but he was, he was the most gifted soldier I've ever met, called Captain Mu. Had total security in, in his district. And he took me to villages and didn't even wear a gun. And I said, Dai Weibi, how can you go around here without a gun? He said, when I was a French soldier, uh, I, my officers told me that gentlemen don't enter, um, enter somebody's home bearing arms. This is a gentlemanly behavior. This is my home. This is, their, this is their home, rather. And I don't wear a gun. And they respect it. They respect that it's safe. He had his own uh, popular and regional forces in there, well trained. He said, well, the first village, he said, I know there are about 40 or 50% communists in here. They know that I know. And I said, well, why don't you arrest them? And he said, well, why should I? As long as they're there, I know what they're doing. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to have good intelligence. Um, and you have to treat them well. And the rest of the people were on his side. And this was really remarkable. Then, that evening, it was lovely, there's a wonderful scenes with my, my sort of interchange with this marvelous man, um, which you can read in the book. Um, very, it became very personal, and, and we were pulling tricks on each other and for, for jokes, but he was a boom, he was like that. So he said, there's going to be fireworks tonight. So I went out to a position forward position about uh, 500 meters from the Cambodian border. We knew that a communist company was coming across bearing 20 uh, sacks of rice or something like that. Important. We knew that. And, um, and I was with his advisor, he was a special forces lieutenant uh, by the name of Kenneth Crabtree. Um, and we lay there under Undercover, it was mosquito net, you know, we got lots of mosquitoes there. And then suddenly all fire, hellfire started, boom, to the right of us, just over. The guy, I said, well, how, later when I saw him, I said, how the hell did you know? He said, I have my people everywhere. I have them in Cambodia. They keep me informed. Why, why would you tell somebody, give somebody, volunteer to give somebody information? Because you trust them, right? You respect them. This guy had the total respect of his people, including Cambodians. I mean, the Cambodians came across, they saw their words. I, I, for example, smoked in those days French cigarettes. I got my gruyas from them. They came over. These merchants were all spies for him, or many of them were spies for him. And he plucked them. And they told him what was going on. This is what, unfortunately, American strategy going back to 65 when they went into, uh, into this mass Tip movement of American uh, combat units in Vietnam, which was precluded. It's very strange. Um, Thompson, who left in 65, I think April or May or something, 65, went back to London, said, you will see, they will come in and they're going to lose the war. And Vietnam will have totally changed. And they will come, get into a quagmire. Because if you send forces out, huge army forces, now you, they need them. I have full respect for the American soldiers of all there. But if you move out and then don't secure the ground and not protect the, 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 uh, the civilians, then you might as well not go. 
So they had, for example, the, uh, the first cavalry division, that was air cab, they had 465 helicopters or something like that, in Anki. So they went out, they went into combat, they got into the villages, and the kids greeted them and, and, and said, Shoi da Koi, and they put uh, here and, and enjoyed themselves with the soldiers. And the night of the Viet Cong were there, because the Americans had withdrawn and returned to base. That was probably one of the, and this is why I, when you asked me uh, my favorite or my most impressive, my, my most powerful impression was meeting somebody who actually in his little district, by the Cambodian port, uh, Mekong Delta, had won the war. Yeah. Uh, so, um, what, what are you telling me, um, make me remember about the assassination of, I mean, the coup d'etat of Ngo Dinh Zien? Part of the reason, and now from Pentagon paper and from many interviews that we done, uh, you know, we can uh, very much see that uh, one of the main reasons uh, the coup d'etat happened and successful was because of the, the American didn't like Zim anymore, didn't want Zim in the, you know, power anymore. Uh, what do you think about that coup d'etat? Do you think that American wise, wisely by do I mean take them out of power? Stupidity. Well, stupidity. I mean, but again, guided by, by guided by the media. Now, I'm quite sure. Look, Ziem was a human being. We're all fallible, and I'm quite sure he made big mistakes. Um, and. Madame Ngu, whose beauty I admired greatly, um, when, she, when she said, what did the Buddhists do? They, uh, they barbecued their monks, and then you know, the, the, the great line was, and they didn't even use the local gas, gasoline, with the imported gasoline. Look, she was a Vietnamese woman. And Vietnamese women, I like the forthrightness of Vietnamese women. I endorse that. I mean, to me, that's very funny. And you know, boom, just say something. You, know, you have to have a, a humor with that, and you have to play, have to have bantered um, with Vietnamese women of that type, especially this highly educated, lovely woman. She was gorgeous. Uh, that upset the Americans greatly. You see, this, this sort of stuff. Was it a wise idea of her to say this? Probably not, but it was, uh, I, I noticed it in my book, I said, well, you know, I, this is memorable. Um, it was, no, the Americans were very unwise because Zem actually wanted to have um, Thompson, you see. He, he, uh, he enjoyed Thompson's uh, ideas. Um, I wasn't there, of course, when, uh, when that happened, uh, but you do not destroy a powerful leader who happens to be on your side, simply because you don't understand him or because he is too willful. Well, he was willful because he was educated, he knew his people, he came from an old Vietnamese family, an educated, learned family. Uh, as, as I said, his father had founded this D.C. Uh, Quoc uh, in, uh, in Hue. Um, his, his brother was um, the Archbishop of Hue. You do not do away with it. Foolish, absolutely foolish, um, and especially with what followed. Then I mean, you did uh, some pretty weak governments that followed. Um, what was the life expectancy? Something like three, uh, three months or something like that per government, until Key took over and then Zim. This is not how you handle a war like that. There, I believe the French knew, uh, knew it better. Uh, I think the French had, um, had a much deeper insight into the psyche of the Vietnamese and handled it better. The problem is, of course, it was a quasi-colony, not really, not all of Vietnam, only the Mekong, uh, the, uh, the Mekong, uh, Mekong Delta was a colony of southern Vietnam, Cochin, China. But uh, the French understood the mindset of the Vietnamese and unless you understand the mindset of the people you have to deal with and who are your allies in a war, how can you fight a war? How can you defend them and defend yourself in the process? That was the problem. But you had um, 
again, you had some very, very good American officers and strategists, and I admired much of them when, uh, when, um, when I was with them. Um, but uh, it's, uh, uh, that's what it was. Uh, they should have... And you see, Thompson, Thompson wrote, it, when it was all over, the trouble is America couldn't wait. And it's very interesting because the most famous German correspondent there at the time is dead now. And that's precisely what Wong Wen Jiat knew. He knew this. I mean, he, he was a smart guy. I'm sorry, he was, uh, was a communist on the wrong side. But he, he saw it. And it worked. His predictions worked. So you think that America learned the lesson of Vietnam War yet in... Uh... No. No. Uh, not the public. No. Absolutely not. Look at Iraq. Look at Afghanistan. Um, how can you throw away... Uh, here's another analogy. We knew at the end of Tet Mautan that the South Vietnamese and the United States had won that war militarily, okay? Viet Cong, North Vietnamese forces, totally destroyed. More than 50% of their soldiers, dead. Um, and then came, and I, we wrote this too, and then came Walter Cronkite, you know, freshly pressed fatigues, I don't know how he got those, and then sat in front of two, 20 million uh, viewers, that this war is unwinnable and has to be uh, negotiated, um, at the end had to be negotiated honorably. When then Johnson responded, I've lost Cronkite, I've lost Middle America. So now we have the same thing. One of the way, uh, reasons why Obama won his first election in 2008 was with his promise to get, uh, to get out of, of Iraq. And now, Fallujah, which the Americans have won, the, the, the wards of military hospitals are filled with crippled men, young men and women, knees missing, necks missing, uh, part of the brain missing, all that stuff that they had fought for, being abandoned and realizing now that, uh, that they, um, uh, they fought for naught, sacrificed for that. No, I don't think so. Until the Americans have uh, developed media and, uh, and, and, uh, and a responsible Congress, um, it will happen again. So in the short uh, answer uh, for my last question, yeah. people said that um, American press contribute a great deal to the outcome of Vietnam War, that South Vietnam and American defeat the war, is that true? Yes. Yes. But with a caveat, I have to be very careful. You, the combat correspondents, the people I lay in the trenches with, okay, they reported correctly. And they risked a lot doing so. It was these, these guys who flew in here from the United States and opined. Yes, and, 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 and uh, you saw the other stories, and they wound up on page 68 of the, of the New York Times. And the big stuff that, were, were, that fueled the anti-war movement, you had in the front pages. And on television. Yes, I, I, I fully agree with that, and I am, obviously, I, I'm, I'm not very well liked by a, a large segment of the American media, because I keep saying that. Um, but... I would still say that the majority of American journalists, reporters in Vietnam, did a very um, decent, professional job. They were not the ones responsible. It's the highfalutin guys who did. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for having me. We appreciate your time and your effort and all your help to our film. Thank you. Thank you.